The National Desk, America's News, now. This week on the National Desk, balloon backlash. Congress quickly launching a probe into the Biden administration's handling of our nation's security. And unfortunately, the president failed that test, uh, and that's dangerous for the American people. U.S. intelligence facing criticism in a war of words in Washington. And a new border policy in the works to expedite the removal of migrants to Mexico. After Title 42 expires this summer, once the COVID-19 emergency is lifted. Plus, cheers and jeers. Because the people of this nation are strong. The state of the union is strong. Reaction pouring in after the president's first direct calls to a divided Congress. The push to finish the job met with a fierce Republican rebuttal. Then, payment push. You may be charged for this. Hospitals overwhelmed with emails now charging patients who reach out with requests. And the fact check team crunching the numbers this tax season. How helping those in need could help shave off how much you owe. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. Inflation expectation, a growing number of Americans forced to stretch their dollar. The Federal Reserve expecting a slowdown soon as it continues a months long battle with soaring inflation. Unintended consequences, a look at the benefits and dangers of artificial intelligence. Pandemic era learning loss, why some states are struggling more than others. But first, spending spotlight, the government's bank account at risk of being overdrawn. Right now on Capitol Hill, some lawmakers are warning about the costs associated with programs President Biden promoted in his State of the Union address. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman breaking down the spending dilemma stirring debate in Congress. The State of the Union, as President Biden laid out, often depends on the state of America's bank account. And Biden pushed buttons, alleging proposals for spending cuts at GOP hands. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. But pushback from Republicans is that Biden's a typical tax and spend Democrat. And aside from taxing big businesses and the rich, has very few real solutions to pay for all those plans. We're going to build 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations installed across the country. And we're helping families save more than $1,000 a year with tax credits. Biden's signature has often come with a hefty price tag, trillions to cover everything from climate change provisions, Ukraine aid, food stamp increases, and college loan debt relief, which Democrats call vital and Republicans call progressive handouts. Well, they can't pay for these plans. That's the problem. We've run up a record uh, debt, uh, uh, larger than the entire GDP. The national debt up $3.8 trillion so far under Biden, but Republicans, too, have had spending problems. Under President Trump, the debt went up $7.8 trillion. Fast forward to the next fight, America's debt ceiling. That now $31 trillion limit to what the government can spend and always seems to flirt with. The president wants it raised now and reportedly only after that will discuss spending cuts. There's going to be uh, no negotiation over it. But economists say spending is also what's exacerbated inflation. And Republicans argue Biden's big Inflation Reduction Act doesn't deserve that title and could make matters worse. Despite calls for unity, the divide over dollars and cents still very apparent. Scott, thank you. Keeping an eye on your money, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell expects significant declines in inflation this year. He also says the strong January jobs report underscores the need to keep raising interest rates. The reality is we're going to react to the data. So if we continue to get, for example, strong labor market uh, reports or higher, uh, higher uh, inflation reports, it may well be the case that we have to do more and raise hikes more than is priced in. 
And speaking of your money, the IRS is telling millions of taxpayers to wait to file their 2022 returns. The agency says it's working to clear up confusion this week about whether certain state refunds are taxable income. It affects taxpayers in states that issued tax rebates last year. For example, California sent out more than 16 million middle class tax refund payments to counter inflation. New details from Capitol Hill following claims Twitter suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story. On Wednesday, three former top Twitter execs testifying before the House Oversight Committee. Republicans accusing the federal government of coordinating with the social media company leading up to the 2020 election. Twitter's former deputy counsel denying any wrongdoing, others admitting they mishandled the story but denied any coordination with the FBI. I was not aware of and certainly did not engage in any conspiracy or other effort to do anything unethical, improper or unlawful with respect to Hunter Biden's laptop. Elon Musk has suggested the government asked Twitter to suppress the story before he took over the company. Federal officials deny the allegation. Trending now, two of the world's largest tech companies, Google and Microsoft, are getting into the AI game. They're introducing technology capable of responding like a human. This week, I took a closer look at the risk that comes alongside this incredible advancement in technology. When it comes to an AI construct that can, that can simulate human reasoning, that's something we have to be very careful with. Even in its early stages, artificial intelligence is changing life as we know it. Two of the world's largest tech companies are getting in the game. Microsoft incorporating the technology behind ChatGPT into its search engine Bing and Google sharing new map and search features. If you were writing an analysis of, of something and if I were to tell you, these are the points, now flush it out and give me the analysis. That it can do reasonably well. If you're in a very rural area where there's no doctors nearby, maybe talking to an AI of any form, uh, as imperfect as it is, is better than nothing. But I think we're a long ways from thinking that we're going to get reliable, trustworthy answers from an AI on something that's high stakes. There are flaws. Google's chatbot making a factual error in a recent demo. AI getting heat for its potential to spread misinformation. Experts pointing to biases that can filter in. So if you train it on a lot of data about a biased world, it's going to make predictions that itself are kind of reinforcing that bias. Experts do point out limitations with this technology, especially in industries where there are so many variables. A human is needed to sort through the details. There has to be an ethical and legal framework put together that will kind of govern how AI is used, how AI is developed and what parts of our lives AI is able to autonomously work in. And from the outside, AI may seem like a sci-fi concept, but experts tell me these models take lots of examples and they mimic it and should be viewed as a tool that can help people do more faster. According to new student test results from across the nation, the pandemic erased two decades of academic progress in math and reading. This week, the fact check team looked into how those losses are measured and why some states are doing better than others at getting students back on track. The pandemic closed down schools, leaving millions of students learning from home for months or even more. A recent Stanford University study showed that learning loss could result in future financial implications, adding up to about $70,000 less in lifetime earnings. I'm with Connor and Courtney from the Fact Check team digging through the research for you. Now, Connor, explain how that learning loss is calculated. Well, there's a few ways, but the one that we looked into is called the Nation's Report Card, and it shows fourth and eighth grade math reading scores hit record lows last year. And as a result, that Stanford study that you just mentioned found students face two to nine percent lower lifetime incomes depending on what state they live in. And that's because the impacts vary by state? That's right, Eugene. And this graphic from McKinsey and Company translates those low scores into learning delays. The average delay for students is 12 weeks behind where they normally should be, but you can see that there are some significant differences between states. For example, 
example, Maryland schools are 24 weeks behind, but Iowa schools are just nine weeks behind. Yeah. And Courtney, what did you find on how school closures specifically uh, impacted those results? The data shows that states that kept schools open, like Florida and Texas, had similar math and reading declines to states like California that shut them down. For example, in fourth grade math, California scores dropped four points, while Florida dropped three and Texas dropped five. Meanwhile, other states with school closures, like Maryland and Delaware, saw a steeper decline with over 10 point drops. The bottom line here is the pandemic had a devastating impact on education, and so far, efforts to make up for that lost time haven't been successful enough to put our students back on track. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's wild to think so many are falling behind on this core curriculum, yet many politicians right now appear to be focusing on the social issues in the classroom that really fire up voters. And just ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now, a legal paramilitary activity across the country. Why one state is cracking down to combat violent extremism. Plus, the latest technology thieves are using to swipe your stuff when you least expect it. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Washington, where Seattle businesses near a homeless encampment are fed up with break-ins and vandalism. We're real concerned about break-ins, thefts, car vandalism. For months, Ken Hagee has watched as the property next door has gone from a Burger King to a deteriorating vacant shell of a building. The inside destroyed and the roof caving in with graffiti, tents and trash covering the area. It's 80 feet away, so I mean it can only get worse and worse. And they just keep moving in more and more. As you can see, they've took over the whole landscaping where the grass is and everything, and all of the parking and all of both sides of the street. Businesses nearby say they've been broken into numerous times in the last year, racking up thousands of dollars in damages and stolen property. Grease Monkey across the street is the latest business to decide they've had enough and are shutting down due to the recent crime issues, according to employees. Seattle City Council member Tammy Morales represents this area. Her office told us the property got a demolition permit in December, but needs to pass inspection before starting demolition. The property failed inspection on January 20th. As the process moves forward, remaining businesses are concerned about what might happen in the meantime. Is the building going to get broke into and all my stuff going to get stolen? Or is the thing going to get so bad that the boss has to shut it down because he doesn't have a choice? And then all of us are out of work as a result of this, like the previous businesses. I mean, it's, it's really... It's really unfair. Now over to Texas. A recent food truck theft in San Antonio is shedding light on the technology crooks are using to get to your stuff even when you think it's secure. One man says his food truck was stolen from a gated storage facility along with four RVs. He was told that thieves likely used scanners to open the gates. Now he's questioning whether these facilities should do more. People pay a lot of money to park there their valuables in these places and, you know, for them not to be more secure about it is kind of uneasy, you know, you don't feel safe. His food truck hasn't been found. In Oregon, state lawmakers are targeting paramilitary groups. A new bill introduced in the state house would expand the definition of illegal paramilitary activity and would allow the state's attorney general to ask a judge to stop a group if there's reasonable cause to believe they have or will engage in paramilitary activity. 
This is not directed at individuals open carrying. This is directed at armed, coordinated paramilitary activity. There would there could be prohibited activity when it is intended to intimidate and when it has that impact of um, of preventing someone from engaging in something they have a legal right to do. While no one criticized the measure, in a recent hearing, opponents have submitted written testimony arguing against it. Ahead on the national desk, America's News Now. A new bill of rights for airline passengers now in the works. The mandatory compensation on the table if your flight doesn't go as planned. Southwest Airlines is changing course. In a Senate hearing Thursday, the company's COO promised to make things right with flyers and prevent a future meltdown. Changes include updates to scheduling software along with ongoing assessments and funding to address icing issues at airports prone to freezing conditions. This week, the National Desk's Jan Jeffcoat sat down with trial attorney Karen Conti to discuss a proposed bill of rights for airline passengers, plus what's next for Alec Baldwin and a mysterious string of murders in Chicago that we're told could be connected. I want to start with Alec Baldwin. He is charged with involuntary manslaughter for the shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Before we talk about his legal team's recent request, which way do you see this case going for him when it comes to involuntary manslaughter? What facts in this case are in his favor? What facts are against him? Well, his argument is going to be, listen, I hired a professional armor. That was her sole job to make sure that these guns on the set were safe. And listen, there should never have been live rounds on a movie set. Who put those in the gun? That's not my job, it's somebody else's job. And listen, there were other people there, the assistant director already pled guilty. So it's the armor, the assistant director, and I'm not the person responsible. I think the argument from the prosecution is going to be, listen, you weren't just an actor on the set, you were a producer. And as such, you had a duty to hire the right people, to monitor them, to have safety meetings. And ultimately, when that gun was handed to you, you should have opened it up and you should have made sure there were no bullets in it. So it's gonna be a close call here. It's gonna be a very interesting trial. And the special prosecutor in this case is also a state legislator. So that is the basis for his team's motion. They say that it violates the New Mexico Constitution. What's the strategy here, Karen? If the prosecutor is disqualified, what would be the advantages to Baldwin? Well, I don't quite know because I've never seen a motion like this. It's a separation of powers argument. So let's just say that the prosecutor is disqualified. I think maybe maybe Baldwin is trying to make an argument that this is a political prosecution. The, uh, the prosecutor is a Republican. He's probably on the other side of the aisle. And this prosecutor is trying to make a name for herself to get reelected. Also, there are limited funds when you have a special prosecution. And so maybe he's just trying to run the clock to try to, you know, expend some money here so that uh, he may feel like he's got an advantage uh, so he you know it, he, to basically deplete their funds so his defense can can prevail over the holiday southwest airlines canceled 16,000 flights that prompted senators to propose this airline passengers bill of rights what are some of the main provisions of this karen Jan, I love this bill. This is a great bill. Basically, it says that if the flight is oversold, you have mandatory compensation of about $1,300. If there is airline cause delays or cancellations, there are mandatory compensation. There's meals and lodging. And basically, if they lose your luggage or they damage it, mandatory fees for that. This is basically just saying if you don't get what you paid for, the airline has to has to cover it. And I think it's a great law. Yeah, and it seems like common sense. If you pay for something, you should get it. And if you don't, you should be compensated. Why haven't had better passengers rights laws in the past, do you think? 
Well, I think the airlines has a good lobby. And I also think that the government looks at the airlines as being fragile, but a necessary service for people who need to get to where they're going. And all the bailouts will, you know, all the bailouts we've had over the years kind of prove that that point. I also think consumers are in a bad spot. You buy a $400 ticket, you get messed up by the airlines. And what are you going to do? Hire a lawyer for $20,000 yeah. to yeah. fight over it? So it doesn't make sense. And that's why they get away with it, because there's no power in, in, that, in that court right. process. There's no recourse for them. Uh, right. Finally, a case that few people are talking about, but one thing that I noticed, at least 11 young men in Chicago have been pulled out of Lake Michigan after uh, a night socializing at bars. And you've been looking at this issue because you think this could be the work of a serial killer. You've represented one of the most notorious serial killers in history, John Wayne Gacy, and his death row appeals. What are the facts and what are authorities saying? You know, the authorities aren't saying much of anything. And I don't think the media in Chicago has even really connected these things because nobody's talking about it. But it, but it's an astounding amount of men. And it could be as many as 15 men in a period of just over a year. And they're all very similar. They're in their early 20s to, to, to 30s. They're college age or in college. They disappear after a night of drinking in a nice uh, area in Chicago. And days later, they're found in either the lake or the river. And this is now being tied to what they call the smiley face killers and I urge your viewers to, to Google that and that's somewhere between 45 and 200 young men who have disappeared all over the country in the same exact way and they're saying that there's a possibility that there is a killer or a group of killers who are doing this in a ritualistic fashion We're, we don't know those facts yet but it's something we really need to watch very intriguing all right Karen Conti always a pleasure talking to you thanks for joining sure. us this morning hope you have a great weekend Still ahead here, the news making headlines next week from the 2024 presidential race and who's in the running. Plus, the latest on Tyree Nichols and the men charged in his death. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, in Long Island, a woman pronounced dead was found to be breathing three hours after she was taken to a funeral home. The 82-year-old was then rushed to the hospital. No update yet on her condition. In California, a woodpecker stashed 700 pounds of acorns inside the wall of a house. Look at this, pest control saying they removed eight bags of the nuts, which the bird had piled nearly 20 feet high inside a chimney stack. Impressive and also annoying. Those stories much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, on Wednesday, former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley is expected to announce her 2024 bid for the White House. So far, former President Trump is the only other candidate officially in the running. On Friday, the officers charged in the murder of Tyree Nichols are set to appear for a bond arraignment. The men are each facing seven counts, including second-degree murder. Increased communication with your doctor could start costing you money. Some health care providers are now charging for certain messages. The National Desk Angela Brown explains how the changes may affect your care and your wallet. The mom Nina once knew was permanently gone. Today's my birthday and she didn't even she doesn't even know. A once vibrant woman Penny now lives in assistant living. She's you know uh, 
permanently cognitively impaired. It's up to Nina to manage her medical care, which includes messaging doctors on my chart at the Cleveland Clinic. One message Nina received left her fuming. So when you use the my chart system now, a little message pops up that says you may be charged for this. The Cleveland Clinic posting this last year alerting patients, my chart responses that require your provider's clinical time and expertise to answer may be billed to your insurance. Other healthcare providers are doing the same. You have that range, $3. I've seen it as high as $160. Paul Siegert is managing partner for PCS Advisors, a health benefits consulting firm. He says you won't get charged for every single message. The general standard is it takes more than five minutes and it takes some medical expertise. The Cleveland Clinic says you could get billed for messages regarding changes to your medication. No charge for asking about prescription refills. However, you may not find out the exact cost until after you press send. We need to communicate it well so that consumers don't, don't hesitate to seek care because they're scared to, to get a charge. On the other side, doctors are bombarded with a ton of messages. One California hospital reporting over three million in one year. I understand that doctors are burnt out. I understand that some of these messages are taking a long time, but sh shoving this burden onto patients, many of whom can ill afford it, especially somebody who's elderly and doesn't have a lot of money, like my mother, and millions and millions of other Americans, it's not fair and it's not right. An informal survey by the New York Times found that nearly a dozen of the nation's largest hospital systems said they charged fees for some of their providers' emails to patients or have started pilot programs. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Angela, thank you. Ahead in our next half hour, spy balloon showdown. The Pentagon's response under fire after another high altitude object is shot down over Alaska. Plus, expedited removal, the new proposed border policy that would fast track the deportation process. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
The National Desk, America's News, now. Developing now Disney Directive. Control over the company's land could soon lie with the state of Florida. Governor DeSantis leading the way after massive cuts for the company. Plus, America's hidden borders. They're freight hubs where agents are finding massive amounts of illegal drugs. The National Desk, Dwayne Pullman with an unprecedented view. And new details on another object found flying over U.S. territory. The high altitude craft the size of a small car near crucial military sites in Alaska. As lawmakers and military officials go back and forth over why the initial balloon wasn't shot down sooner. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. We begin with the latest on China's suspected spy balloon operation. The U.S. military has shot down another foreign aircraft, this time off the coast of Alaska. Unclear what kind of capabilities it had, just that President Biden gave orders to take it down. Sinclair's chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, has the new developments tonight from Washington. President Biden ordered the military to down the object, and they did. The National Desk, America's News, now. Developing now Disney Directive, control over the company's land could soon lie with the state of Florida. Governor DeSantis leading the way after massive cuts for the company. Plus, America's hidden borders, the air freight hubs where agents are finding massive amounts of illegal drugs. The National Desk, Dwayne Pullman with an unprecedented view. And new details on another object found flying over U.S. territory. The high altitude craft the size of a small car near crucial military sites in Alaska. As lawmakers and military officials go back and forth over why the initial balloon wasn't shot down sooner. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton, and we begin with the latest on China's suspected spy balloon operation. The U.S. military has shot down another foreign aircraft, this time off the coast of Alaska. Unclear what kind of capabilities it had, just that President Biden gave orders to take it down. Sinclair's chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, has the new developments from Washington. President Biden ordered the military to down the object, and they did. The Pentagon confirming another American fighter jet shooting down a foreign aircraft off the coast, this time near Alaska as it approached the United States. So at this point, uh, we don't know the origin of the object. Um, again, we will know more. Uh, once we're able to potentially recover some of those materials. That less than a week after taking out that Chinese spy balloon after it had already crossed the entire U.S., raising immediate questions and debate about when and how quickly the White House should react. President Biden saying he has no regrets in that previous case and downplayed the incursion over U.S. soil. The total amount of... Uh Intelligence gathering is going on by every country around the world is overwhelming. This is not a major breach. Further, Biden saying it didn't damage relations between the U.S. and China, but some say it should. And now, aware there have been several less intrusive flights in the past, have questions. Do we have a plan for when this happens again? We think we know what they were going to collect. We don't know. That scares the hell out of me. 
This new incident near Alaska and along the Arctic coast where we reported for full measure, flying with the U.S. Coast Guard on constant patrols over remote waters, looking for incursions by Chinese and Russian aircraft and ships along the maritime boundary line. And where critics say the balloon should have been intercepted well before making it to the rest of the United States, both parties agreeing a strong message must be sent. Prompting rare bipartisanship in the House, which voted unanimously to not only condemn China's use of the balloon, but also to request the Biden administration to continually update Congress with comprehensive hearings. Especially as some tell us China's reach is growing closer to the U.S. every year. Also in our own backyard here in Latin America where China is very prevalent, uh, I think that's going to be the greatest national security challenge that we face. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. And earlier this week, the National Desk Jan Jeff Code went one-on-one -on -one with author and China expert Gordon Chang, shedding light on the U.S. response to China's spy balloon program and what kind of data it could have gathered. Thank you. Let's start with the administration's response to this. This surveillance aircraft was able, Gordon, to fly across the U.S. for an entire week over several military bases, including, as I mentioned, strategic sites where we have nuclear missile silos before it was finally shot down. What did you make of the timing here? Well, the timing is, I think, uh, shows that the U.S. military is not prepared to deal with threats from China. So, for instance, President Biden was not notified until the fourth day of this incursion. And that means that was past the time when this could have been shot down over Alaska or Canada, in other words, uninhabited territory. We also learned yesterday from General Von Herk, the uh, commander of NORAD, that his rules of engagement did not permit him to bring this balloon down when it entered U.S. territorial airspace. So really what we have here is not so much a political failure on the part of the president, but a failure on the part of the Pentagon. And the American people need to look at this very closely. Because we're also learning, Gordon, this is not the first time China has spied on the U.S., far from it, in fact. But the, the audacity, the gall, it seems like China has elevated their risk at this point. What type of information are they gathering and for what purpose do you think? Well, this balloon flew over Maelstrom, Minot, Effie Warren, Offutt, and Whiteman Air Force bases. And those, as you point out, um, they're also, they're ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Sites. Offutt is where Strategic Command is headquartered. Um, this looks like they're preparing um, a first strike on the U.S. I mean, this is absolutely serious because we're not mentally prepared. We don't think of the Chinese in that term. Um, but clearly, that's one of the things they could be doing here. And as those tensions escalate, what are you watching for specifically from China, Gordon? And how should President Biden be responding at this point? How would you advise the administration? Well, the thing to look for would be what the Chinese military is doing, because they've become especially politically powerful in Beijing. Um, and this could be a situation like 1930s Japan, where a military takes over a country and goes to war. And we know that the Chinese military right now actually controls a lot of the foreign policy. With regard to President Biden, he needs to start looking at China not as a dialogue partner, but as an enemy that poses a critical threat to the United States. He should be having, um, I believe, uh, I think he should be trying to cut contacts with China right now, not trying to talk to China, because China doesn't really want to talk to us. If they wanted to, they would have allowed Secretary of State Antony Blinken to go to Beijing on February 5 and 6. But with this provocation, it looks like they wanted to derail those talks. So we should stop trying to talk because by trying to talk, we embolden the worst elements in the Chinese political system by showing that China can do anything and we will still try to maintain dialogue. They would have also warned us that a balloon would be flying over some of our uh, nuclear missile silos here before we caught it ourselves. This also comes at a time, Gordon, when China is buying up a lot of U.S. land. Why is the U.S. government allowing an adversary to do this? It shouldn't be. Um, we know that China is engaged in some very suspicious activities. There's been a lot of uh, publicity, for instance, about the Grand Forks Air Force Base, where a Chinese company bought 370 acres within 12 miles. But we also know in Oklahoma, um, there are very, very um, concerning and troubling developments. So, for instance, there are these illegal Chinese marijuana grows. There was uh, gangland murders. Four Chinese nationals were killed. 
Um, there are hints that China is actually basing child sex trafficking operations on uh, Oklahoma land. Um, in Oklahoma, the Chinese parties are building fences. And everybody in Oklahoma has a fence, but people in Oklahoma build fences to keep uh, people out. The Chinese are building fences to keep people in. And so this is, we, we shouldn't be allowing Chinese to own any land in the, uh, any farm or ranch land until we figure out what's going on. The Biden administration is now considering an unprecedented step to help stem the flow of migrants at the southern border. The new plan would be a fast track deportation process known as expedited removal. Under the proposed policy, many non-Mexicans would be deported to Mexico. The White House is still leaning on Title 42 which allows authorities to turn away certain migrants at the border. The fate of that policy for now remains up to the Supreme Court. Disney is now the latest company to report deep job cuts. The company is laying off 7,000 workers. CEO Bob Iger making the announcement Wednesday, saying it's part of a new round of cost-cutting measures. This comes as Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is a step closer to stripping the Reedy Creek Improvement District away from Disney. On Friday, state lawmakers voting to authorize DeSantis to handpick a board to run it instead. The state previously granted Disney powers similar to a county government to operate its properties in central Florida. Efforts to do away with those powers came after Disney opposed DeSantis's parental rights and education law, which critics called the Don't Say Gay Bill. Charitable giving could help you save on your taxes, but the groups that give the most might surprise you. This week, the fact check team figured out just how much money Americans are giving away. Charitable giving is expected to increase this year. 60% of American households participate in some kind of charitable giving. And in fact, Americans gave more than $480 billion to charity in the year 2021. I'm back with the Fact Check team tonight, breaking down these numbers for you. Janae, you looked into who's making these donations. What'd you find? Well, Eugene, we spoke with the National Philanthropic Trust, and they say in 2021, the largest source of charitable giving came from individuals. Now, these folks represent 67% of all donations. The rest comes from corporations and foundations. Now, people give for many different reasons, but among them, to lower their taxable income. So let's take a look at that. Right, so when you donate cash to a public charity, you can shave off up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. Okay, now the higher earners give more money. Is that true, Courtney? That's exactly right. The wealthiest Americans give the most, but this is interesting. People making less than $50,000 a year are the second highest givers, while people making between $100,000 and $500,000 are the lowest in terms of their income percentage, and this is all a According to DonorBox. And how much do the top donors give? Take a look at your screens. Forbes lists the top 25 most generous givers. Warren Buffett is at the top. He's given $51.5 billion over his lifetime. Bill Gates and his ex-wife Melinda are second and have given $38.4 billion. George Soros, Michael Bloomberg, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg are also on the list. That is a lot of money. Ladies, thank you for more on this Fact Check Team topic, including links to where they found their information. You can scan the QR code on your screen or visit us at the nationaldesk.com. Ahead here on the National Desk, fighting to keep the top spot. Why Iowa must fight to hold the first presidential primaries after a new DNC decision. Plus, parents protesting to protect a playground. The action they want taken over a nearby home that houses sex offenders. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From Iowa fighting to hold the first presidential primaries to an Oklahoma student who saved a classmate's life, we're taking the pulse of America, starting with parents protesting a transitional home near a new playground. 
It was the grand opening of the Maytown Community Playground. It's amazing to see something uh, this special come together. But the park where children will play sits next to a contested property, a transitional home nearby that will house sex offenders. State Department of Corrections and Department of Social and Health Services officials had to address safety concerns. Once we heard about next door, I think that kind of energized our group to get the ball rolling and make things happen a little faster and make a stand to say this is our neighborhood and this is what we would like to have in our neighborhood. It's not about the sex offenders. It's not about DOC. It's not about DSHS. It's about us at the community coming together. The mayor of Tenino not holding back on what he'd like to see next. I'd like to see next door get uh, thrown in the trash. It's important that people are vigilant, that people are making their voices and concerns heard. We need to and we need to take action and we need to let our legislators know at the state level what the things are that we want in our communities. The DNC is getting ready to shake up the 2024 presidential nominating calendar for the first time in half a century to replace Iowa first with South Carolina, followed by Nevada, New Hampshire, Georgia, and Michigan. It just doesn't reserve a place for Iowa in that process. But without approval for date changes, New Hampshire and Georgia will now have until June to get their state leaders on board. South Carolina on February 3rd, Nevada on February 6th, and nothing for four weeks until Michigan. It's a, it, it's a disaster. Iowa has the flexibility to move their caucus state around. You can reconfigure the calendar and we can move our process readily. Denying Iowa's request, the DNC will be moving forward. The calendar came out of the White House. A rare bipartisan issue for Iowa Dems and the GOP, both rooting for Iowa to remain first. I think it's a big mistake. I hope that they reconsider that and uh, rethink the position and come back to Iowa. A moment he can't put into words. It means a lot. Derek's teammates say he's too humble to accept any kind of recognition. The sophomore homecoming escort he saved, Trey Shotton, is showing his appreciation anyways. It made me feel like somebody would actually be there for me. It gave me a lot of respect for Derek. The moment that piece of steak went down the wrong pipe last week, Trey tapped on the homecoming king's leg. He looks at me, he's just like pointing at his throat and mouth. I'm like, I'm just like, what? And then I just see that there's just these tears running down his uh, face. And I'm like, oh, dang, he's choking. Derek immediately performed what he learned in a training class, the Heimlich Maneuver. Derek's everything you'd expect in a hero. He's a team first guy. He's a, just a great student, great guy. That was the last thing I expected was to save a life brave guy. Still to come, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the State of the Union to social media suppression. That's next when we come back. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Scott Thuman, our chief political correspondent, President Biden facing a divided Congress for the first time in his presidency this past week at the State of the Union. How'd that go? Steve, it was a bumpy ride for the president, uh, not only because Republicans disagreed with a lot of what he said, but because they made it known and were very vocal. You had members they're on the chamber floor who were at times booing, other times shouting. Uh, uh, in most extreme cases, there was name calling, people yelling and telling the president he was a liar in the middle of his comment. The reason it was problematic is because you had over the president's shoulder for the first time during a State of the Union, Kevin McCarthy, the new Speaker of the House, Republican, who was trying to keep his party in lines with these nonverbal cues, but at other times even shushed his own party members because he would like to see this relationship get off to at least a somewhat more civil start between his party and the president. We don't know if this is going to be a precursor for how these two will interact moving forward, especially when you have tough legislation that's coming up. They need to find consensus on, like raising the debt ceiling. Will it be this difficult? Are Republicans going to try and be a thorn in the president's side at every step? Some members, especially the more extreme members of the Republican Party, have indicated they do plan to. 
and economy a big part of his speech. National correspondent Atra Elnishar polling shows Americans continue to be pessimistic about the economy as President Biden said that it's strong. Right. And, you know, I think uh, David Axelrod put it best when he said that every president in a state of the union has to confront the gap between progress and perception. And right now that gap is a wide one for President Biden. He's got a laundry list of bipartisan accomplishments, particularly last year, think the Chips and Science Act, et cetera. But Americans uh, generally, when we look at the polls, just are sour about the economy, about their personal finances. And often in these polls, it shows that they're blaming that on the president. So what we'll be watching for, Steve, is as the year progresses, as these pieces of legislation actually take effect, uh, we'll see if a president, if, if they play out the way President Biden uh, says that they will, as they've been written to do and lower costs for Americans, uh, or if uh, people will just stick with this sour sentiment, regardless of whether the economy improves or not. Uh, Senator Tim Kaine, a Democrat of Virginia, gave a theory as to why sentiment remains low, even as the, the labor market is robust and inflation is, is, uh, is st coming down. He said it's just been such a tough few years that people are hesitant to get their hopes up. And national correspondent Christine Frizzau, House Republicans calling Twitter executives to Capitol Hill this past week to grill them about the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story. What do we learn? Yeah, this is interesting because this is the story in the New York Post that came out in October of 2020. So just weeks before a very important presidential election. And Twitter made the decision back then to not allow that story to be shared at first. They changed their mind within 24 hours. But the committee really focused on why that decision was made. They called the former head of trust and safety from Twitter, Yoel Roth, as one of the witnesses to testify. It's interesting, though, because he actually didn't think the story should be suppressed. He thought it should be allowed to be posted, but said people higher up thought it violated Twitter's hacked materials policy. It is, if you think about it, a little unbelievable that somebody with his uh, a high profile as Hunter Biden would leave their laptop in a repair shop, but that it seems is what happened. Very political in nature, though. Republicans trying to highlight exactly what happened. Democrats instead focusing their time on Twitter as the platform that was used to plan the January 6th attack on the Capitol. So in terms of exactly what came out of the hearing, well, like most things here on Capitol Hill, it depends on who you ask. A lot happening in Washington, and as always, you guys are all over it. Thank you uh, for joining us, and Dee Dee, back to you. Guys, thank you. Still ahead this hour, America's hidden borders. The search through millions of packages for drugs smuggled across country lines. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. Despite a heavy focus on our country's physical border, federal officers are busy inside America's hidden borders, air freight hubs. Spotlight on America's Dwayne Pullman gained unprecedented access inside one of these hubs to see firsthand how CPB officers are searching for and finding massive amounts of illegal drugs. Tonight at three of America's largest air freight hubs in Memphis, Louisville, and here in Cincinnati, millions of packages are scanned, sorted, and sent to far-flung destinations. This is the border. In the middle of it all, officers of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, are on America's hidden front lines in a never-ending battle to catch contraband. You're kind of playing a game of, of hide-and-seek out there with, with the bad guys, right? And the bad guys are getting better at hiding illegal drugs. From heroin hidden inside shampoo bottles and containers filled with fentanyl melted inside candles to meth molded into cell phone cases. All right, we'll go to the other side. It's just after 1 a.m. and a highly trained canine named Bruno sniffs, then sits next to a box being shipped from the U.S. to Australia. A cube that drugs are inside. 
A trip over to an x-ray machine reveals something inside a crock pot. Oh, so what's in there? Some substance? Possibly. You wouldn't... Officers pull out plastic bags filled with sparkling white crystals. In the lab, a test confirms it is meth. Wow. A scale reveals so there's a lot of it. That's a kilo of meth. Yep, kilo of meth, 2.2 pounds. In 2021 and 2022, CBP officers across America seized more than 14,004 pounds of meth hidden in 1,188 packages of air freight. Back at the x-ray machine, CBP officers are taking a close look at a shipment from Ecuador labeled as coconut oil. That's ketamine? Ketamine. Known on the streets as Special K, ketamine is a powerful anesthetic and hallucinogen. In the last two years, CBP officers across the country seized more than 6,941 pounds of ketamine hidden inside 961 packages. Back on the floor. So that looks like a normal karaoke machine. Inside a karaoke machine, Whoa, so bags of marijuana. Like. Look at what he's got. A pound of high-grade pot. Marijuana is number one on the list of CBP seizures, with more than 32,029 pounds of it uncovered inside 18,145 air freight packages in 2021 and 2022. Add more than 9,850 pounds of cocaine, 2,500 pounds of opium, 547 pounds of heroin, and a long list of other drugs. And over the last two years, CBP seized 124,605 pounds of illegal drugs in 18,145 packages. Even though some drugs do get through, CBP is proud of its record. We're beating the threat at the front lines. Catching contraband before the packages fly away. For Spotlight on America, I'm Dwayne Pullman. Dwayne, thank you. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. And you can also find us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here next week.